Welcome to Uncover, the show dedicated to exploring what we need to know about God, the enemy, and ourselves to win the war for our destiny. Your host, Dr. Peggy Karlosky, psychologist, writer, and speaker, admits that there's no new truth, only that that hasn't been uncovered. And now, here's your host. Hello and welcome to Uncover. I'm so glad you joined me today. You know, I want to talk with you today about voices. I want to start off with telling you about an encounter I had recently. Here's how it started. If I couldn't do any better than that, I'd go to the house. For those of you that's not from the South, let me translate. If you can't do better than that, I'd quit. I heard those words all the time, said Sue. Sue was sitting in my office trying to get help for some of the hurts in her life. Her eyes welled up with tears as she recalled her childhood. Anytime I messed up, even just a little, like maybe hitting the wrong key when I was playing the piano, Dad would bark. If I couldn't do any better than that, I'd go to the house. Her voice trailed off as she remembered how she felt. It seems like anything she did, even when she thought she did well, that voice would tell her otherwise. Sue continued, I do that. I quit as soon as I make a mistake or I meet with a challenge. That voice that began as far back as she could remember was still guiding her. That booming voice darkened her world, her view of herself, and the possibilities. You know, we all hear different voices. The, vo- the Bible even talks about that in this world we'll have a lot of different voices and none without significance. And what happens is we don't always realize that some need to be discarded like garbage. You know, when we're children, we're very susceptible. We don't know that the voices we hear from parents, teachers, and others that we think are bigger and know more than we do, we don't realize that they're not always right. We don't always need to accept their voices as credible. Many grow up never coming to the recognition that they could have chose which voice to tune into and to follow. Some people go to their grave not knowing that that voice that had darkened their world was actually false. I have another dear woman that I have counseled on and off for quite some time. And much of the damage that has been in her life came from the voice of her mother, that critical, nagging, controlling voice that always put a spin on everything in a negative way. And even after mother died, She says, I can just still hear that voice in my head. It's took a long time, but she has got much better at recognizing that voice needs to be quieted. How do we do that? We need to recognize there's other voices. If we'll listen closely, we can hear them. What about those voices that encourage us and make us realize that God's going to be there for us. You know, there's all kinds of voices. If you think of voices like thoughts in our head, there's so many that we need to monitor and distinguish between which ones to hear is credible and which ones to, to reject. I had another woman one time that was talking to me, and she was telling me about some experiences in her life, and she was talking about them very agitated, and and she was obviously um, distraught about some of the things that she was describing to me. And I found myself feeling a little bit confused. I thought, well, they're not even those that big of a deal. Some of the situations that she was talking about were just nuisances in life and irritations, but they weren't any big catastrophe. And as I started question her I said I don't understand they don't seem that they're that big of a deal it's almost like the more she heard my voice 
I could see her face even look calmer and like this recognition. And she said, I guess I just need a voice of reason, don't I? And I was like, yeah, you really do. A voice that says, wait a minute, calm down. It's not that big of a deal. Whereas she had heard from her background voices that kind of overreacted and she had just followed that lead. What kind of voices have you paid attention to? What have you been subjected to? I have a dear, dear friend of mine that she was married for many years to a pretty cruel man. And what I mean by cruel is, oh, he could be so cruel with his words. And he would make such derogatory comments about her. And he'd make fun of her appearance. And and he'd put her down with his words. And you know that voice? She accepted. And I thought, how sad, because she was one of the most beautiful people I knew inside and out. And yet somehow she had accepted that voice as being true. And I I thought about that and thought, how sad, because it had also affected decisions she made in her life. You know, the the first woman that I was describing to you when when I started this program today, I said she made that comment, if I couldn't do any better than that, I'd go to the house. What she found is that she realized she had missed out on a lot of opportunities in life listening to that voice, that she had settled. Many times we miss out on wonderful blessings, not just like the woman who ended up feeling bad about herself, but there were so many things that she might have accomplished in her life had she not followed that voice in her head. If you think about voices that you let influence you, you may find, just like all of us, that there's some we need to discard There's some we need to challenge with a different voice. You know, I can recall um, being a young girl, and when we moved down from Detroit, uh, we moved down from downtown Detroit to the countryside in Tennessee, and I loved the countryside, and there was a store that was about a mile away from our house. It was just a little country store, and sometimes if we had extra change, We'd walk all the way that mile up to the store to get maybe a candy bar or some bubble gum or something. And there was a um, a neighbor and a, a likable fellow that he was the owner of the store. And he'd chat with us when we'd come and he knew our family. And I grew up, you know, near that store. And when I grew up and I had graduated high school and I was looking forward to going on and starting a uh, college and I went up to that store one day and was just, um, I don't even know what I was doing, but I was visiting and I was getting some things. And the uh, owner, he says, well, hey, what are you doing now that you're out of school? And he was asking me about my plans and I was excited to be starting school. And I was telling him about what I planned to go into. And and, uh, I, I assume I must have told him that I wanted to be a psychologist. And he just flippantly just discarded my thoughts. And he just basically said something to the effect of, you won't go long enough to do that. And he just was pretty flippant about it, kind of just balked at my lofty notions. And he dismissed my dreams as if they were no more likely to happen than the tooth fairy bringing me a million dollars. And he didn't act angry or anything. He just flippantly stated it. Even though it irritated me, and I thought, well, I'll show him, I was kind of stunned by his attitude. Because, see, I had grown up hearing the voice of my mother. Her voice was encouraging. Her voice made my dreams seem very possible. She never even seemed to consider that I wouldn't make and go after whatever I was going after. Of course, her voice also taught me to try to really find out what is God's dream instead of just my dream. You know, uh, lots of times I've heard um, um, a well-known TV speaker, and he's a really awesome speaker, and he's very encouraging. And I've heard Joel Olstein, and he's so good at trying to make you believe in your dreams and encourage you. But sometimes I find myself thinking, first and foremost, we need to understand that we need to see if it's God's dream for us. 
not just flippantly decide, I'm going to do something and have all this encouragement, but not have sought and said, God, is this your dream? So even though mom's voice was encouraging and it just kind of indicated I could do anything I wanted to do if I put my mind to it, that voice also taught me to seek what God's will is. Didn't always do it, didn't always follow it, but I just wanted to give an example of the different types of voices that we need to be aware of recognizing. Just like Sue needed to recognize her father's voice was one that she needed to not follow. Now, even though we're supposed to honor our mother and father, if their voice is abusive, if it discredits the word of God, and it eats away at the faith we're supposed to have, we have to recognize it may not be credible. But the different types of voices, one type is the one just like the guy at the country store talking to me. It says, you can't do that, or you won't do that. Have you heard that voice? Has that voice influenced you? Or like my dear friend that had that voice that said, oh, you're so ugly. Look at you, you snaggletooth. You, you, you know, and would say cruel things. What voice have you heard? I want us to look at even the Word of God and recognize what happens if you listen to the voice wrong and you listen and follow it. Sometimes it's minor consequences, but sometimes it's huge. And we read about that when we read about some examples in the Bible, good and bad. I want to read from you some in Numbers in the 14th chapter, and I'm going to paraphrase some of it, and then some of it I want to read directly. This in the in Numbers, the Lord, the, the Israelites, God's chosen people, he had brought them out and shown them miraculous acts of God where he had freed them from bondage, from slavery. And he had already promised them that not only he was going to deliver them, but he had promised them the promised land, Canaan. And he was going to give this land to them. If God's already promised it to us, we can take it to the bank. He's already promised it, just like he promises us eternal life if we accept Christ as Savior. But anyway, so we pick up in Numbers where, you know, we see that the Lord has already promised them. And, and, and what happens is that they're getting ready. God is instructing them to send out spies. I'm going to back up and give you a little background in chapter 13. God's not saying send out spies to see whether you think you can take the land or not. He had already promised it to them. But sometimes we need to go after our plans and go after God's direction and how to go about things and be strategic and, and so forth and prepare. So I think that we got to assume that the Lord's kind of asking them to check it out to see how you're going to do this. So if we in verse uh, 1 and 13, I'm reading, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. It's almost like saying, let them make the decision that they're going to go after this land that I've promised. I'm already telling you I'm giving it to you. So it's almost like have them take accountability. You know, I, I can relate to this in a, in a way in my practice. In my private practice, every once in a while, I'll get a phone call from someone that says, you know, I'd like to make an appointment for my sister or I, my son really needs counseling and I, I'd like to set up an appointment for him. Now, if that's a child, I understand. But sometimes they're calling and trying to make an appointment for another adult. And what I typically do is I explain to them, they need to call me themselves. I appreciate your support. I can give you the information. But if they're capable, they need to call me. Why do I do that? I want them to make the investment. They're much more likely to not only show up, but see this as they have made the decision. They're making the commitment. They're investing in their counseling. 
Maybe that's partly what God was saying when he says, send the spies out. Because you think about it, he's saying, from each tribe, send a man. There's going to be a leader, a representative from each tribe. So Moses does that, and he picks from each tribe, and he gives the name of the men. And it's like they're making the commitment to, to go out here and do this, to spy out the land, see how they're going to go about this. But then as we go on, here's what we find. Let's look and see what happens. I'm going to pick up here because what we find is that some of the spies were discouraged and their voice was like the voice of Sue's dad. You can't do that. Just go to the house. But Caleb, his voice lines up with encouragement and hope. We got this. We can do it. I'm going to pick up and I'm going to read in, in chapter, I mean in verse 26. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh and brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. When you, yeah, where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalites, Amicalites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb speaks up. He quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great statue. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so were we in their sight. Do you hear what their voice sounded like? The voice of doom. We can't do this. How dare they say such things when the Lord had already said, I've given it to you. I've promised it. You know, we have all probably done that before. God makes promises in his word. He says he will never leave us or forsake us. But our voice might say, God's forsaken me. He might say, you know what? When you've repented, I have forgiven your sins. I remove them from the east, far as the east to the west. I'm not even going to remember it anymore. But that voice in our head says, God still sees what I've done. He's mad at me. He's going to hold this against me. We can have voices that refute what the voice of God has said in the word. That's what these men were doing. Let's look at the result. Because we've got to be careful which voices we listen to. So all, I'm starting in chapter 14. So all the congregation lifted up their voices. Let's hear what their voices said. And cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has God brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Oh, look how hurtful this was. Moses was hurt. Aaron was hurt. They fell on their faces before him. Oh, Joshua was hurt. The, and then we go on down and keep reading. I'm going to go on down to verse 7. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, they tried to get them to see reason. The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. 
Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Did they listen to that voice of reason? It was a voice of reason because it was based on God's promises. He had already told them. But did they listen? No. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the meeting before all the children of Israel. If you go on and read, you're going to read where the Lord was so upset with them. He was going to wipe them out. Verse 12, he says, I will strike them with the pestilence and disherit them. I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. But Moses, he rose up a voice of mercy. He begged for God to be merciful and to forgive them and to not destroy them. Oh, he, he had a voice that begged for mercy for his fellow man that had been so wrong in how they acted. And you know what? God changed his mind and he spared him. But they missed out on the promised land. How many times have we missed out on wonderful things that God had planned for us because we listened to the wrong voice? Sometimes we developed our own voice that said, I can't do that. God, I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not worthy of that or I'm not smart enough or whatever it may be. As we go on down, I'm going to keep reading verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. So he, he gave in to Moses and he spared the people. I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. Do you hear that? They didn't heed God's voice. Do we heed God's voice? Do we even hear it? Anyway, he says, and they have not, because they've not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. How sad. I wonder in my own life, how many things that God really wanted for me that I negated because I didn't heed his voice and I listened to other voices that discouraged me or led me astray. And there may be things that I've missed out on that I don't even realize. But look what happened to those that listened and held to God's voice. Verse 24, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, or you could say, listen to my voice and let it lead him. I will bring him into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. You know, even when he said his descendants, you think about, we influence our children, our grandchildren. We can start seeds that pass on down from generation to generation. You know, I have had clients that maybe they had, been warriors from the time they were little children. And if they looked back in their bloodline, they came from a line of warriors. Or you can have ones that they came from a line of they all were mad and always blamed everybody else. What does our voice pass down to our descendants? What voices do we follow that pass on down that our children to see what we follow? Do we follow what the word says or do we follow the voice of the world? It's so much to think about. It's a very sobering thought. This series that I'm starting, I really think is probably some of the most important that I could speak with you about and to, and to encourage you to consider what voices are in your head. Where did they come from? What voices do you let influence your feelings, your thoughts, and your actions Probably all of us have some. We're in a fallen world that need to be discarded. I just so encourage you to join with me in this series as we start looking at the different types of voices that influence our lives. We need to recognize those that need to be rejected. Today's, that voice would be, you can't do that. That's one of the main ones this voice says, you can't do that. That new business that God's laid on your heart, 
that new ministry that God's birthed in you. Maybe you think you're going to start a blog that's going to encourage people. Maybe you think that you're going to pick up a hobby that you've always wanted to do. Maybe you think about some relationship that you're involved in. Whatever it is, there can be a voice that tells you, that's not going to work out. You can't do that. There's no way. The economy's too bad. You don't have enough skill for that. You don't have enough experience. That voice can drone on and on and on. Yes, first and foremost, we do need to seek God's advice. And let me tell you what I mean by that. I really have had some different experiences in my life where I really sensed God's voice trying to direct me. No, don't do this. In fact, it, it wasn't, uh, we know that his voice will try to get us to stop doing sin, but I'm talking about just decisions we try to make. I may have shared this with you before, but this is the example I think of many years ago. I, um, well, I've been in private practice for over 20-something years, 21, 22 years. But years ago, I was working at a mental health center, and I was wanting to go completely full-time into private practice. But I didn't know what God wanted, if he was okay with that. And in this instance, I sought the Lord, I sought the Lord, and I just couldn't seem to get what he was wanting me to do. But bottom line is, uh, a wise pastor said, Peggy, if you don't have a peace about it one way or the other, wait on God. And even though that irritated me because I just wanted him to help me figure it out, that was so true. So I said, okay, God, unless I really sense that you're giving me the okay, I'll just stay where I'm at. I submitted within days. See, God knows in your heart whether you want to obey him, that you want to do the right thing that you're just confused. I didn't know what God wanted me to do, but he knew in my heart that I wanted to obey him. So within days, I just knew. I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was the voice in my spirit. I just knew, but it wasn't saying, yes, this is what I want you to do. This voice seemed to be more like, I'm okay with it. I just had such a peace about it. God wasn't against it. And he has so blessed my practice I can't take credit for it. It's just the love of God, the mercy of God. His hand has been upon it. He has sent me wonderful people to work with. And I really recognize God knows your heart, whether you want to only obey him. That is it just a selfish dream. Or if God says, I really don't want you to do that, that you go, I want to do it anyway, God. The Lord knew that I didn't want to do it if he didn't want me to. Now, I have a different example where... I was contacted by somebody. I wasn't even looking for a job. I loved what I do. But somebody contacted me with a job offer that it was it was unbelievable. It was too good to be true. The phenomenal salary, what it would involve. It was just one of those that one pastor said, well, wow, that's one of those you don't even have to pray about, isn't it? But as it got closer and closer in my spirit, again, I didn't hear an audible voice, but I had such a sense of dread. I thought, why am I feeling this way? This sounds like it's just manna from heaven. But that voice in my spirit, no, no. It more felt like a sense of dread. I finally recognized the voice was saying, God doesn't want you to take this. It was like the weight of the world was off my shoulders when I went in and said, I can't do it. I can't take this position. I walked out of there knowing that voice in my spirit. Yes, thank you. You obeyed me. God didn't want me to do it. How do we recognize his voice? It's so important. How many times I've thought, if I had overrode that, if I hadn't heard the voice, or if I would went ahead and did it, I think it could have been disastrous. I think it would have... I would have missed out on so many of the rewards in my private practice. I think I would have missed out on some of the peace of God using me and so many other things. But you know what? Sometimes I've not heard the voice. Sometimes I've made errors. God is gracious. He's not this mean God that says, Oh, well, you missed out. You blew it. Sometimes we're fearful about missing the voice. 
Instead, I want to provoke encouragement to say when you hear the voice and you sense God saying, you know what, I feel like God is directing me here. You've prayed about it. You've asked him and you have a sense of a dream that God's put in your heart, a business, a relationship, a hobby, something that you feel like he's a ministry. Recognize. How do you tell when it's the voice of fear? It's a voice from your past, probably that negative person, that person that negates faith, or maybe even the force, the voice of Satan himself. You can't do that. Recognize God's voice is different. You may have a voice that's kind that says, nah, see that voice of dread, it wasn't harsh and, and it wasn't a spirit of fear. God says he didn't give us a spirit of fear. Sometimes we have a voice that's just out of fear and it's not of God. But there may be that sense of, uh, I don't have a peace about it. I'm excited about this series that we're going to explore together because I really believe it's the foundation of a victorious life. We've got to monitor those voices in our head. Or you could say the thoughts. And we've got to know which ones sound like God. Which ones are based on the word. But which ones about circumstances like whether we take that job or this relationship. We need to get good at distinguishing. Because Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. And the voice of another, they don't follow. If you're like me, I'm not always sure. Don't get into condemnation. we got a lot of voices trying to mess with us and confuse us. But he wants it to be clear. He knows your heart. If you really want to distinguish his voice, he's gracious. He's not going to let you fall off a cliff because you heard wrongly. Instead, just keep seeking him and asking him, Lord, help me, help me recognize your voice and help me to follow it. I thank you for joining me today. I pray and invite you to continue the next few weeks as we explore voices, how to distinguish ones that we need to follow and ones we need to reject. Thank you so much, and I look forward to next week on Uncover.